I just want to say this this testimony I just want this testimony to bless anybody out there that has felt like their life has been wasted that they feel like 15 16 17 18 20 years of your life doesn't matter how much of your life whether it's one year to 20 years of your life has completely been wasted that God can completely renew that time that has been you feel like has just gone to nothing and so my, my life started back in 1995 I took my first breath my my mom had an in-home birth and my parents are just mainstream Americans. Um, was born into a small little home there in Lake Dallas, Texas. And um, the one thing that my parents always did was they wanted to have they wanted to have a close family. And so my parents really, really valued the uh, tight knit family from the very beginning. At age five, my whole my whole entire life turned on its head. I went from having movie nights every Friday night as a three, four, and five year old. We had um, relatives over all the time. My mom wore pants. We blended in with society. No one would have known a difference. At age five, my parents go to a, a big book fair and they're wanting to buy homeschool curriculum. They're done with the public schools and this would be like 2000s. And my parents meet this group called the Mennonites. And it wasn't just a, an average group of people. They're really similar to the Amish. But my parents ran into this group that was selling their own literature. They had basically made their own school curriculum. And the aspect of how it all started was they started talking about church. They started talking about this. They started talking about that. They started asking, why do you sew your own clothes? Why do you grow your own food? Why do you live off the grid? And no, not even six months later, my parents joined this Mennonite church. And I, at that young man age, I really feel like children don't know what's happening. They just, they just follow their parents. And so I just remember one Sunday, um, I'd always play with my dad's ring. He had a simple, simple band on. And I remember one Sunday it was gone. And um, I'm adding this to sort of give you a little perspective of where my, how my brain processed it all. And one sun Sunday the ring was gone and I asked dad, I was like, dad, Where's your ring? And he's like, well, son, I don't believe in that anymore. Like, in the Bible, it says, you know, this and this and this. We shouldn't wear anything, any adornment, any jewelry and everything. I'm like, okay. So I just bought into it. And from that moment on, for the next 15 years, I was raised in a, I now know it as a religious cult because of the way that it was structured. Ladies were not allowed to speak in church. They were very oppressed. They were never allowed to voice their own opinions. And so I watched how my four other sisters were constantly put down, constantly put down. Anything that they wanted to do, no, no, no. You stay at home, you wash the dishes, you do the laundry. And I saw my mom. My mom is this um, very charismatic woman and I love her so much. But I, I, I need to share the story that needs to be shared. I was um, physically abused growing up, which just I got literally whipped all the time. I don't know what happened, why the church was heavily influencing my parents, and I do believe my parents wanted what was best for me, but it was a, a really dark time for me and my siblings because um, little did I know one of my younger brothers had gotten a, um, physically sexually abused as well, and so I not only had to face, I didn't know that till later, but not only was I facing these dark clouds of getting whipped for everything, not asking permission before I left the house. I'm talking little things, like just asking the question why. My parents would fly into a rage, take me upstairs and give me just spanking after spanking after spanking. So I started growing up in a very fearful mindset and it changes the way you view God. If you grew up in a, uh, you speak and then you get whipped environment or you get punished for practically everything you do, you end up being really, really scared to approach anybody in authority. So at the age of 14, um, I, I remember the preacher was talking about hell. And I can close my eyes and just remember the whole scene. Uh, we were in this old, old building. There's like 120 farmers in there, Mennonites, that's what we were called. And the preacher was talking about hellfire. And I literally started feeling my skin burn. I was like, I didn't want to go to hell. And so I was like, I got to give my life to Jesus so I can get saved from hell. And so at age 14, I gave my life to Christ and I was so charismatic, like something switched inside of me. I remember when I, I committed my life to God, something did change inside of me. Um, but there was one issue. What changed was good, but instantly people were like, oh, you're, you're just going to grow cold. They saw how joyful I was. 
because the Holy Spirit rested upon me. But they saw at age 14 how charismatic I became. I became very talkative to people where I wasn't. I struggled with insane anger issues, like just very shameful to speak about it. But as a teenager, I would just beat up anything and got in my way. I was just wrathful. And one thing that I do remember was after I gave my life to Jesus. And where do you think that anger came from? That's, I love that. Okay, so the question of where do you think the anger came from? I believe a lot of it came from the stress of what was happening in my home. Um, I wet my bed for like a solid 20 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And so for almost 20, 21 years of my life, I struggled with nightmares. I struggled with night paralysis. I struggled with, the doctors could not figure out. They looked, checked my gut out. They checked my whole entire body out. And they, I was wetting my bed every single night. And my parents literally were besides themselves. They could not figure out why. But I was, now looking back, I was actually under an insane amount of stress. Yeah. And Steve, okay. No, no, what, what kind of nightmares yeah. did you have? So, no, I love that. So the, the type of nightmares that I had were like a hundred bricks were on my chest. And I would wake up, I was on the top bunk. I would always sleep on the top bunk. Sometimes I'd sleep on the bottom, but I had three other brothers in my room. We always shared one, one room. We lived in this double wide up on top of this hill. We had a farm that surrounded it. We grew our own food, grew our own everything. It was really awesome. But the nighttime was really fearful for me because I was, we were never allowed to watch movies, so I wasn't getting influenced by like the radio movies. Uh, I didn't have any bad friends. Like No one around me was doing anything wicked from what I knew. But what I would do is I would go to sleep, and I'd wake up in a cold sweat and I couldn't move. And all I remember was there being like, I felt like there was so many bricks on my chest. And it happened over and over and over again. The first time I had night paralysis, I believe I was five years old, I remember being a little, like a little kid. And I remember for the first time I couldn't move anything. So these demonic attacks started happening on my life. And I, I now believe that those demonic attacks happened because God had a calling on my life. And the devil knew, I, I, the devil knew something was going on he didn't know the whole plan, but he knew something was happening. Um, and I smile now because of the joy that God's put into my life, but it was an insane, it was an incredibly dark time. So go ahead and take us back now that you were charismatic and you had all of this joy, but it's like this bipolar too. That, you know, yeah. you have the anger and the joy. Okay, so yeah. take us from that point. So I had an awful relationship with my younger brother and it was to the point where we had swore we were gonna kill each other and we had guns in the house and at one point I felt like we were both serious about it. Like we were gonna shoot bullets at each other. And it was at a point in my, my teenage years where I broke down and I said, God, I know that you were in my life. And my brother and I were having murderous interactions. Like we were pulling out like gardening tools against each other. And it was like a Cain and Abel. Like if anybody knows anything about the Bible, it was like, it was a very like hate filled relationship. And he's like, He's eight, he's nine years old, and I'm, I'm 14. Right. And so I had a, I, a friend of mine talk to me, he's like, dude, um, if you don't get your relationship right with your brother now, you guys are gonna hate each other the rest of your life. So I repented and I completely like renounced. I just took it upon myself to renounce that type of hatred I had towards him. And from that on, my brother and I started mending our relationship together and I actually renounced the spirit of anger. I said, I feel like I'm being demonically possessed by anger because it would take control over me. And I couldn't control myself. And it would fly into fits of rage where one time I remember it was this crazy. My parents were fighting in their bedroom. I could hear stuff being thrown around and I just grabbed a gun and ran out the back door, ran to our barn, ran through the barn, passed all the hay bales and tractors we had in there, ran to the back and just started shooting this door that we had propped up on a side. Little, there was chickens behind it, I didn't know it. They exploded with like, they got scared, none of them died. They ran, uh, some were running underneath my feet, some were running next to me, but it just shook me up because I could have killed an animal. I could have killed an animal in my anger. Right. And those were type of the like, I had many of those fits of anger, but yeah, that was one of the more worst anger fits I remember having. And now take us a little bit about how the atmosphere was with the Midianites. Yeah. Yeah. What was that culture like? I yeah. mean, how was your household like a typical day for you? 
Yeah. So it's the, the Mennonites, it's, uh, it's pronounced really funny. So they originally started from this guy named Minno Simons back in the 17th century. It's a very old ancient religion where they actually broke off from the Catholic Church. Oh, this is like back in England, like way back in the Dark Ages, the 1600s, 1700s. But what happened was this man named Menno Simons started a religion. He started a group of Christians that broke off and they called him, his name was Menno Simons. So they called him the Parasites. Then they're like, no, let's call them the Mennonites. So it's actually a curse word. So how you pronounce it is like Menno, like a Menno, like a Menno. Menno, night, like night as in nighttime. And so Mennonites for over 300 years have had a very strict, rigid, um, I don't know if you watch like uh, any like reality TV or anything, but you look like the, the reality shows of Amish basically take that, add electricity and cars. Pretty much the same thing. Oh, and a telephone. We were exactly the same, but we were pretty much cut off from the world. Mennonites have, they have their own banking system. They have their own insurance policies. They have their own network of food supply, food chain. They, um, when the 08, happened, 08 crash happened in 2008, Mennonites were unaffected. So you had your own currency. Well, they use the American dollar, but they hold reserves so they can help each other. Gotcha. So they don't rely on outside people. Some Mennonites do take outside loans, but they really like support each other. Like I knew guys that had just stacks of cash because um, they just believed in being in their own bank. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was a very, very tight, tight knit community. And I do remember as a, a child, people would stop by like our, our yard, they would drive by our house and they would jump out and take photos and be like, oh, don't be the Amish, don't be the Amish. And they'd be taking photos of stuff. I was like, just out there weeding the garden, you know, and like our goats are running past me and like we have like two or three cows out in the front and they're just like taking all these photos. I'm like, okay, whatever. My sisters are like wearing these like really tight head coverings and they have long hand sewn dresses on. And I'm just sitting there in my overalls like, what's wrong with these people? Like, why can't they just move? But I didn't realize how weird we were. And then, yeah. now you said there was times when it was pretty joyful in the community. You felt like a peace there. Uh, there were some good times yeah. and bad times, but there were some good times. Yeah. What were some of the good times? Tell us about those. I'd say we always, once a year, we'd have this church gathering and we would put on relay races. Um, we would have a race where everyone would put a spoon in their mouth and put an egg, a hard boiled egg on the, the front and you would run as fast as you could with your team. They would pair up on like five different teams. And churches from all over, there'd be like four, five, six hundred people that would get together. And I just remember those days were the most joyful because I didn't have to ask permission to leave my mom's side. I didn't have to ask permission to leave anywhere. And, um, but little did I know um, later on that there was a lot of like ratchet stuff going on behind the scenes, um, which I'll dive into here later. Okay. Yeah. Now there was a significant event that happened, but before we go there, you said you had realized that God had developed a ministry gift in you of music. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the whole aspect of music when it started, I, um, I, I got a hold of a book called No Compromise by Keith Green, and it was a, a book that completely changed my life. But I, had, I read it in secret. My older sister who left um, nine years before I did, she was banned by the church. She was cut off from our family. We were not allowed to visit her. And so for many years, actually, um, I would have been 15 when she was excommunicated from the church. So about a year after giving my life to Jesus, I started getting really cold, very religious, very rigid, just day to day, memorizing scripture, judging people with it memorizing the rules, judging people with it. Every day was like a transaction with God. Like as long as I did my part, I knew God was going to do his part. And basically I felt like I could move the hand of God by being righteous. And so by the time I turned 17, 18, um, I had another radical encounter where one time I woke up at two in the morning and I felt like I had something burning inside of me and I didn't know what it was. And I had a piano in my room. And so I started just playing these simple chords, G, D, and C. I just remember playing those chords over and over again, or G, D, and E minor. I just play them. All of a sudden, I got this song, and it was like A minor, F, C, G, and I started writing a song with my brother, and it came, and we had the whole song in 15 minutes. It like hit, and was like, if you ever have an urge to pee, it was the very similar feeling, and we just, this whole song was just birthed, and we're like, 
this is insane. We just wrote a song. We just wrote a song. And I'm 18 at the time. And, and by that time, um, we had moved to another, actually another colony. Right. So we had moved into a stricter colony where everyone, we didn't have our own bank account. Everyone had everything in common. We lived in a very tight-knit community. as like a village. Now, how did that happen? Was that because you said you had to apply to be in that community, right? Yeah, so my parents are always in the pursuit of, I love this about my mom and dad. They never, they just always want more and more and more. And it, some, like, it's destroyed our family to one sense. But it's also showed me a lot of what, who they are. They ended up wanting to get away from the Mennonites. They were done with the Mennonites. And they were like, let's move in with the Hutterites. Very similar branch. But the Hutterites had one thing that no one else did. They've been doing this for like 400 years. This one way of living. They've never changed a thing. And basically how they do is they put all their houses in a circle or like a horseshoe. So picture a horseshoe. The wash house where everyone washes their laundry is in the center. The farms are around the houses. So anywhere anybody wants to go, it's right there next to them. So we lived in this very tight-knit community. No visitors were allowed unless they had, were given outside permission first. And every day my, my, my schedule was just rigid. But by that time, I was already had enough of a reputation in the church of being just like, because I do believe God's given me the gifting of being a pastor. Um, but it's the aspect of, they were like, you, we see potential in you to become an elder in the church. And so I was like, I, I took that bait and I ate it. I just ate it all. I'm like, oh, I'm down. I'm down to lead the church. But I, I ended up becoming really cold and really like um, iron fisted with my approach to the, the, the young people. Um, to dive into the question, just to remind me what, what you were asking again. I sort of went off on this tangent. No, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's fine. But I was talking about the ministry gift, how uh, that came to you, and you explained that. Now, there was a significant event that happened in your life. Yeah. Right? That really took a turn, you know, of your future. Yeah. So, I was about 19 years old, and I remember it was cold winter days, like in February. And we had built this hockey rink. And we were practicing, just scuffling around, doing what dudes do, you know, out in the ice. And someone from out of state was there. And he was new to hockey, and he slap shot at this puck. And before I could turn my head, the puck was in my face from a very strong young man. That puck went straight into my mouth. Like, it was a direct hit. And um, everything went black. And a second later, everything was back together. I like saw stars for a minute. And when I, I couldn't even touch my face, it hurt so bad. But like, I looked down and there was just like this pool of like blood everywhere. And my face was just pouring. It was just going. And my teeth, back of my, my bottom row of teeth was actually in the front of my, my throat. And my tongue was over top. It was awful, awful, awful. I ended up only losing two teeth with the wax, which was an absolute miracle. But what happened was I went to the hospital, they wired my face shut, and I'm laying there going, I must have sinned against God because my theology at that time was like, if I did anything bad, then God had the right to punish me. But since I couldn't think of anything bad that I did, I was like, God must be angry at me. I must have did something wrong. And so the next week, month, the next couple months that ensued, um, the restrictions got lightened on me because they couldn't always send someone to go with me to town. I was never allowed to go to town by myself. I always had to have an accountability partner just to make it fall into sin or go to some like hooker bar or something. I don't even know what was going to go on. I mean, whatever they thought I was going to do. But they started giving me a vehicle on a regular basis. So I gave my, the surgery adjustments because they had to finish. My teeth were so loose. And during that time, I went through, uh, I, I was in the middle of my depression. And I didn't know what depression was until actually a year after I got delivered from it. But what happened was, I started feeling hollow. Yet the shell on the outside had to keep a smile, had to keep the, I mean, my face was free, like completely freaking wired, but I still kept the amazing personality. You gotta, if I would have showed any signs of weakness, I would have been immediately demoted from all places of authority. And so what I had to do was literally fake it. I had to, preach like I meant it, but inside I was questioning everything. Hitler uh, talked about this thing called a Mein Kampf. It was the inner night of the soul, the dark hour of his soul. 
he wrote a book on it. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the man that tried to kill Hitler, also talked about his own mind comp. And so I believe every single one of us go through a season of our life where we go, we reach a point in our life where we're just dark inside. It's just dark, dark. We just think about a lot of dark things. And our soul is experiencing a dark moment. And at that part, I felt cold. My inside, I remember just forcing myself to eat. I was feeding myself through the straw and then until my jaw got enough strength back, I was able to eat food, soft food. And during that time, no one knew I was in depression. I did not let a single, not even my closest friends knew I was going through depression. No one knew that I felt suicidal. And it got to a point so bad that I remember going into my room. I always took a three o'clock nap. I love naps. And I remember going into my bedroom, I grabbed my pillow, and for the first time I grabbed my pillow, threw it on my face so no one could hear me, I just screamed bloody murder into this pillow. I, I cussed God out, I used every word I could think of, any word I heard of, I used it on God. I said, why did you make me? Why would you design me with a gift? And then slap me on the face with it, quite literally slap me on the face. And right after the hockey accident, the elders told me that the music I had written was from the devil. My parents told me that if I didn't quit this demon worship, that I was going to go straight to hell. Like, people in my life were just telling me, I was getting overloaded with this information, like, this gift that I had. Like, if you all of a sudden found that you could play golf incredibly well, it's like when you started playing golf, everyone in your life would tell you it's sin, it's awful. Like, if you keep playing golf, you're going to go to hell. That's what happened with me in music. Like, I started writing it and teaching the choir this music. This, this baby I had, I started giving it to people. And people started getting, like, Holy Spirit started getting outpoured. While I'm going through depression, I was just like, just giving. Just giving, 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 giving. And I felt constantly attacked demonically and physically by my, the people that I looked up to. That I, I, like, I heard God through. And so, I go to my bedroom. I'm, I just finished cussing God out. I take my nap. Go back to work. A week later, I take the same exact nap. This was exactly seven days later this happened. I go, I lay on my belly, and I remember laying on my belly, I turned my head right, and I felt my neck snap, like an audible, like a pop, mm. like, a, like a crack. And I remember I couldn't move, I was, just, I was paralyzed. I had my hands down, I believe, and I couldn't move a, a thing. And I couldn't breathe, I couldn't breathe in, I couldn't breathe out. And I, I thought I was having another like night terror, you know? Moments later, I see the back of my head. And at that point, I'm going, okay, this is super crazy. Just don't freak out. Everything's gonna be okay. Like I'm trying to tell myself, but my ears started hearing stuff. Like so much information is hitting me now. I'm realizing that I'm separated from my body. I'm standing there looking at my body and I start hearing things like miles away, people starting their cars, like supersonic stuff going on. And I remember looking at my body going, no, 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 I cannot be dead. I cannot be dead. There's no way that I'm separated from my body. I'm not ready to die that even though a week before I had wished I was dead. I basically told God I wanted to end it. If he didn't show me what my purpose was, <laughs> that's one thing I missed with the cussing out God part. I just got back up here. When I cussed God out, I told him, I said, if you don't show me what I'm here to live for, I'm, I'm basically going to take my own life. I don't want to exist anymore. And it's, I'm not proud of it, but that's just what I did. I, I, was, I was so done with everything. I was, I was spent. So after my neck snapped and I'm looking at my dead body, I'm not breathing. I just watched myself for a minute. I'm like, okay, I'm not breathing. I tried to realign myself with my flesh. And it, in that moment, I was not thinking straight at all. I was very sporadic. I was very erratic, with, irrational with my thinking. I started hyperventilating. And I remember putting my hand back and it went through the dresser. And I went down and I remember looking at it and I'm like, I remember pushing my hand through the dresser and pulling it back out again, it's wood. And I remember feeling like, I'm a spirit. Can you, could you feel your body? Could you feel the wood? No, I couldn't feel the word, wood, but I could pinch myself and I had a little mark where I pinched myself, I felt pain. Mm -hmm. So I could choose to hold. So you pinched your soul. Yeah, but it was almost like I had, like my spirit had another body. Gotcha. And the, the aspect of like I could choose to hold something and I could choose to go through it. Like I, I had options. And I didn't even go down the hall. Like I, I, I realized I was like, okay, I'm dead. 
I can't get back in my body, my life is over, and I just walked straight through my wall. I didn't even, I didn't even use the hall. I didn't use the door, nothing. I just went right through my bedroom wall. Did it feel like anything when you went through? Nothing. It literally just felt like I just phased through it, like a, a little, a slight wind passing, like nothing, no pain. Like the molecules of the wall just felt like a wind when you went through. Yeah, it was just like walking. Like when you walk into a room, like if you go through a door, you open the door and you walk in, it felt like that transaction entering one space to the next. There was nothing that could have stopped me there. So I run outside. And I start panicking again because in my mind I'm thinking, maybe someone can see me, maybe someone can snap me out of this like vision, this dream, this bad experience I'm having. And like everything was crystal clear. Like I looked around me and things were really, really clear. And so I remember running up to this one lady, she was she had a baby on her hip, she had she had a basket of laundry, she was gonna do her job. That's all she was allowed to do. And I remember screaming, like, help, 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 help. And while I was doing that, someone walked through me. Mm. And I remember looking at their eyes, and uh, I've ever watched Di Divergent. Yes. Remember that scene where everyone's drugged, and like uh, everyone has like this like glazed look, and they're just like, Salaja, and they're all holding guns. It's just like this like I could not talk to anyone. I was like locked, like I could not get into that world. Yet I was in another world. And my hearing is still going berserk. I heard someone start their car again. I heard someone arguing about supper, like dinner, what they were gonna eat for dinner. I heard uh, kids laughing and then another kid screaming. And I started like, my senses started getting heightened, like to the point where my brain was in complete overload. And I was starting to like, ah, starting to freak out again. At that point, an angel just shows up and is like, it's time for judgment. And I didn't even look. I was like looking at you and it'd be like, this legend of the faith right next to me, just like showing up, it's time to go. And the, the angel literally said that, it's time for judgment. He said, it's time for judgment. That's all he said. He said, it's time for judgment. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm not doing anything on this earth. I'm locked out. People are driving past in tractors. Kids in little like carts are going past me, being pulled by their maid. Like the community is still living. No one knows I'm dead. What did this angel look like? At that moment, well, I know what he looks like because I looked at him later. At that moment, I did not look at him. So I was looking just like you, and out of my peripheral, I could see this angel next to me. He was about eight feet tall. At that, I'm about five foot, 11 to three quarters. So I'm almost six foot. But um, the uh, aspect of, he was quite a bit bigger than I. And I just remember, I just said, okay. I was sort of in this state of shock. And I'm gonna get into what the angel looks like here in a minute. So I'm there on earth, my feet are on the ground. Let me put my feet on the ground. And he said, it's time for judgment. He said it one time. And we just started lifting off, lifting off the earth. And we passed up, the earth got smaller and smaller. And then we started going through those levels. And on those levels, there was like, it felt like it was almost a building that was off the earth. Like there was levels in the sky. Like there was a level one, then a level two, and then a level three. And there was demons actively walking on these levels, looking at the earth. And as I was leaving the earth, they started calling out to me, "Don't go!" They had these, like, they sound like they had been, um, like, literally breathing smoke their whole lives, screaming at each other's, and they, f it just, the hair on the edge of my skin just stood up. What did they look like? They just looked like all types of different types of creatures. What did you see when you seen those demons? Yeah. Did they so, still look human? What? Yeah, a few of them looked human. Some of them had like uh, horns that were just like deformed and pointing off. Um, I do remember one looked like a rhinoceros. It was like huge, but it had like human a human head. Um, oh gosh. Yeah, looking at a bunch of them, they just literally brings me chills. But they, what they did, they all had human voices, so they could communicate. But they, a lot of them were arguing with each other. And they, they had hands, like they would reach out, don't go, don't go with him. And I literally just held on to my angel. So there are like thousands of these. Hundreds of thousands of them. Wow. I could not count, there were so many of them. What are you thinking? My question is, you said you were out of the earth realm. Mm -hmm. Were you in outer space? Were yeah, we we're going into outer space, so we're leaving the atmosphere of earth. Okay. Like we had passed the clouds. Gotcha. I don't know, maybe a couple miles up. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like Google Earth when you do that right. first thing and just barely the edges come into view. That's what it looked like. And there's all these levels that were passing. Well, you know, Paul talked about the three heavens. So, you know, you talk about three levels. No so, way. Yeah. That's really cool. Right. Okay, I never thought of that one. 
But so we're passing through these levels, and as I get further and further and further away, my heart's racing. And I, I, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is, this is not real, this is not real, this is not real, but this is all, it's all happening too fast for me to process. And as we got further and further away, they called out again. They're like, don't go, don't go with him, come with us. And in my heart, I knew I had a decision to make. Like, I could still make a decision. This angel was not forcing me to do anything. I could join the, hor the horde of evildoers in the spirit realm and disobey the call of judgment or whatever will happen. Or I could go and go to judgment. Was there a temptation? Oh, absolutely. Like, I had to make a decision. I'm like, okay, either I do go with them and avoid what I don't know and stay with what I know. Okay. It was an intense draw to stay on earth. Like, this in, like my heart wanted to stay on earth. But my mind was like, do not go back. Like, I knew somehow my mind was like, do not go with those demons. And at this point, there was no name of Jesus in my head. There was no recollection of me being saved. There was no, like, I just knew I died, and it was time for judgment. And do not go with the demons. And so this angel is rapidly taking me away from the earth, and the earth closes over. I don't know if anybody's gotten Google Earth and, like, zoomed out. I think we've all done it. Um, and at that moment when it zoomed out, Basically, all the levels like combined, and I remember seeing armies of um, not angels, armies of demons running across the face in formation, but they were like crossing over each other, and I heard them arguing, "Go this way, go that way." No, 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 no. You take over this region. They would talk about what they were fighting for, and they were screaming at each other and arguing like there was some reward system for, like there was some reward system for whatever they were trying to accomplish, and. There was these bright sun flares that would shoot out from the earth. Sun flare over here looked like it was, you know, near Guatemala or wherever the S South America was. And then they would all rush over that spot. And I'm watching in horror as smoke is going up from the earth. And they're like covering it like, 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 a, like it's just wet, dripping blanket over the earth. And it like was choking the earth. And they were fighting. And they were doing this like big football pile up over time. There was a sun flare. And all of a sudden I realized, that is the good on this earth that's happening. I knew right then and there that there was good on the earth. That was God. And the demons were at war. It was a, it was a war against good and evil. And I was like, oh my goodness. This is a fight against good and evil or evil and good, whatever way you want to see it. Like there was no in between. Mm. And the thing was that some of these demons had like very like um, strong bodies. Some looked like they were starved their whole life. And I don't know why some would be so healthy looking, but yet so disgusting. Yet some had like no foreheads, some had very large foreheads. Like they looked different. Did you see any angels? In the midst, going for I did not see a single angel. At that time, other than the one next to me. That, right. At that time, you just seen that demonic army. Yeah. Okay. Other than the huge light rays that were shooting from Earth, that could have been angels underneath the cover protecting the children of God from these demons. I don't know what was underneath that shield. So as I'm leaving Earth, the Earth is now this very small globe, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's like a speck, and then it just literally disappears. And before I knew it, an instant later. I was in this wall of water and I, I don't know why there was this giant wall of water but it stretched for many miles in every direction like it was a, it was a protection and it was about six seven feet thick maybe eight foot eight foot thick from what I could just see from side to side but I'm suspended in this wall of water I'm now I'm helpless before up to this point I could choose what I wanted to do now I'm in this wall of water and the angels now in front of me and I can see him through the wall of water it's just strong very strong angel, white hair, um, had, a, had a bit of a weathered face, but it was shining so bright, like it was just glowing. And I'm in water, and I'm seeing this figure, and he speaks to me and said, it's time for you to breathe everything that is, it's time for you to breathe everything out that is of this earth in you. I'm like, I have to breathe out the air I'm holding in, trying to stay alive here? He said, you cannot go where we are going with the air you have in your lungs. And I literally felt like I had to surrender. And I'm sitting there fighting, struggling. I'm like, 
I blow up some bubbles and the bubbles just like just go. They just like they just like disappear in mid water. And I'm like fighting and I like pretend to blow out all my bubbles. I'm holding it, holding it, holding it. He said, no, I, I know you're holding it. And I'm like, frick. And I like, I just fought and I fought and I fought and I fought holding on to what was in the earth. The last bit of what I had from my, from the earth in me. And then I just thought to myself, what am I doing fighting this? Like I'm dead. I can't go back. I'm going to surrender. And so I just surrendered it. I was like, I, just, I let it, everything leave my body and I just felt like something left me, the air that was in my lungs. And at that instant, I was transformed from facing this way to the opposite way and we broke through the wall together and below me was the throne room. Like two or three miles out, like it was off in the distance looking like a stadium. Like about the size of a football stadium, there was clouds. I could see clouds surrounding this tall structure that stuck out of the clouds. and. It was so bright. It's like taking one of these lights and just shining it in your eye, turning it all the way up and shining it in your eye. I'll try to go look at the sun during the, during the middle of the day. It hurt my eyes to look and as my eyes adjusted, we started dropping rapidly. Like we started descending, descending to the throne room. And we're already in space. So I don't know where we're at, how we got there other than leaving the earth so fast. And as I descended into the throne room, we got closer and closer and closer. And it's like that tickly feeling you have when you, the elevator drops too quick or you go over a hill. And we touched down into the throne room. And the glory of the throne room and of where God sits was unbelievable. There were these tiles about this big, some were a little bit bigger, but most of them were about this big, about a foot across. And they went down for, it looked like, like many, many feet. Some looked like they went for 100 feet, some went down for like 10 feet. But artists had like basically carved like artwork and then filled it up with clear ros resin and then had laced it with gold. And there was like the most insane piece of art. I'm like landing, I'm stepping on it. And it looks, it's like the most expensive artwork that you're walking on. That's, that's the floor of heaven or the throne room. And I look up. <clears throat> I see Raymond. <laughs> I didn't see Raymond. But no, I, I see angels and they're of every nationality all around me. And they're all standing there just like straight faces. How many are there? A lot? Like, is there hundreds? <laughs> I lost, I could not count, but it, they went up so high, it looked like the bleachers just kept going and going and going. I would estimate there were at least 100,000 just in the throne room observing. Um, I've, been, I've, seen, I've seen a stadium with like 80,000 people in it, or a, a photo of one. Pretty sure it was at least 50 to 80,000 people in this huge stadium. It looked like there was more of them because the bleachers just kept going up and up and up. But I do remember the people that were closest to me. And I could see them and they were all standing there. Some had robes on, some looked like they had normal clothes, but they were glowing. They, they had their, the edge of their skin was like fluorescent looking. Like it was just like the glory of God was emanating through every single one of them. And I looked around, I looked to my right, they're just, they went off and then the, the, the square turned around, went behind me, they were all behind me. I didn't even bother looking behind me because it's the same exact thing in front of me. And I look at this angel that brought me here and he's tall and he's super shredded, like he has, like major guns he's been through I don't know if he's been through battles whatever he's been through but he's really really strong and my heart's I'm I'm scared for my life like I'm thinking I deserve to be in hell I do not deserve to be in this holy place and I looked to my left and I saw a throne and there on that throne was God I knew in my heart it was God and he's drinking out of a coffee mug this big white mug and he takes a sip and he sets it down and it like disappears into his face because it's shining again like the sun and I cannot like emphasize how bright everything there was not a hint of darkness the only thing that was dark was me <laughs> and I was like I felt so dirty in the presence of God and I will tell you this this is a this is really really important that you hear the, the hear the contrast that happens here so I'm looking at God and my heart fills with rage I'm like, there's babies dying on this earth. Earth is in turmoil and he's up here in his throne room drinking out of a mug. Who does he think he is? Or she, or I believe God is all in one. You know, he's created male and female. From God came everything. So evidently he's, he is woman and man at the same time. But like, he's, he's God. 
And as I'm thinking in my head, like, I'm, I'm raging against the maker of the universe. And me as a, as a, uh, a 20, 21 year old man, just raging against my maker, shows you the pride I had in my heart. <laughs> so, so just, I was so full of darkness. It was just unreal. And this is like the, that during the time of depression I was still going through, I had this vision. And I'm looking at God and he's just not doing a thing. Just staying there. All of heaven is silent. You couldn't hear a pin drop. And as I'm standing there, I hear the words, it's like a surround sound. Let judgment begin. And it's like, you're in a theater and the voice comes from within you too. It's like, it goes through you and you can't control it. And out of nowhere, these big hologram screens pop up. And there's like three of them. One to the side, one to this way, and one this way. And they're clear. So people could see them from every direction. And my life starts playing from the very beginning. When I was born in 1995, my parents holding this sweet little baby to the struggles of my early childhood. Um, my dad quitting his job. Us, our family struggling financially, trying to grow all of our own food from a farm. My parents both having marriage issues and then blaming us children for it. I saw all these bad memories happening. Near death misses, like I saw fights I had with my siblings. Like not a lot of it was good. Like the only good memory I had was when I was born. Like that was one sweet memory. And I did some shameful things. I was like, I was like, oh my goodness. Oh my God. Everything is in the open. Everyone can see it. Not a detail was missing. It felt like the whole time of judgment was like four to five days long. It just felt like it tracked on and on and on and on and on. And so we're getting it towards the end and I watched myself. I used to do, pre I used to work in this little, um, sh like this shop where I spray painted and did high pressure spray painting for storage sheds. And I remember setting my gun down. I put it in some water cause I was gonna get back to it at 3.30. I go home, start the hot water for my, the tea I always love to drink at three. And I went and took a nap and it's like 3.01 and I lay on my bed. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm thinking in my head, like, don't you dare lay down. And right when I lay down, I hear my neck snap again. So it was like beginning of my life to the death of me. I didn't know if a blood vessel popped. I still didn't understand what happened. If an angel struck me on the neck, I don't know what happened. Cause like at that point, everything just sort of snapped black and all of them, they folded up and went into the ground. Like it just, they just went, they just came out of nowhere. And I'm sitting there shocked. Like, that was the life I lived. Like, God poured his life into me. Like, I'm thinking this, like, I know God made me. And I'm like, that was it? Like, that was my whole existence? And it blew me away how empty it felt. And how upset I was at God for everything. Like, it was all his fault. And he's like, the next words I hear is, is his name in the book of life. And I'm like, frick, I forgot about the book of life. In Revelation, it talks about the book of life. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like my name better be in the book of life. And the, my angel, oh, I look up and there's this thick notebook he's holding. He's holding the big arms. He's standing right there next to me. For all I know, this could have been Jesus. I didn't see any nails, no holes in his hands, so most likely not. But like, I, I remember seeing this angel next to me, and he's the same one that took me from earth, and he's holding, he's reading through all these names. Daniel, Jessica, Kaylin, Kayla, and like there's thousands of names on this one page. And this book is thick, full of the names of the children of God. And I'm thinking, I'm starting to panic again, like if my name's not in the book of life, then I'm done. The very angel that took me to heaven will take me to hell. And I, or take me away from the presence of God. That was the first thought. I was like, I can't, I like, I started becoming attached to my surroundings. Like the place, like I felt no pain other than the inward turmoil I was facing. And so as I'm rationalizing, like, what if I just claim a name? I felt like I was becoming dishonest. I'm like, I cannot be dishonest. I can't decide to just claim a name and go, oh, I'm Timothy, I'm, I'm Daniel, that's my name. And I felt like doing that. It was like this urge. And I was like, no, I'm just, I'm just gonna accept whatever fate. It was that same surrendering feeling I had in the wall of water that I had in the throne room. I surrendered again. And, oh my goodness, here it is before it gets crazy. All of a sudden I hear, 
Jojo. He's naming all these names off and all of a sudden goes silent and I hear Jojo. And God stands up. He literally leaps off his throne. The mug disappears and he faces me. And he's like, Jojo, you were not scared to stand up and say my name in public. You were not scared to stand up and shout my name and glorify me in public. You were not scared to give a glass of water to your young sibling. And he started my life from the very beginning. He started when I was born in 1995. He rolled the scene back. He threw up the screens again. He said, this is how I see you. And I literally only saw good, 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 good my whole entire life. He showed me when I helped our neighbors harvest their cherry trees. He, saw, he showed me every time when he saved me from dying on a tractor one time. He showed me all these instances in life where he was watching over me. His hand was upon me. He said, I've had my hand on you this whole time and you think I'm an angry God. And he's like, showed me everything and he's speaking with this voice that just goes through me. I'm like, I don't deserve this love. I don't deserve to be forgiven by you. And he, he just like, he turned, he was from the side when he was speaking to me, he turned and faces me and all of heaven is rejoicing. They're shouting with joy and he goes, I love you, you're my son and I forgive you. I love you so much, I will heal you of what you're going through. And he basically shot this like rainbow laser fusion beam into my heart and it hit me right on my chest area. And he just goes Whoa, right at me. And he basically gives me a huge hug. And I looked down and I saw bitterness just fly off. I saw my hatred for everyone I, I hear. <laughs> And I see lying, hating, cheating, just slough, fly off. Like, I'm looking at all my old man. I'm looking at all the old JoJo, everything I've held on to my whole life. And it's just getting torn up. It's just getting completely, like, taken apart. And God is just pouring his unconditional love into my life. And I was like, how are you doing this? How are you holding my grief in my heart? And he takes the hurt and the pain of my childhood of being physically abused. He takes it and he completely like, he removes it from my heart. He says, it's not part of you anymore. It's not who Praise you are. And, and I remember I started weeping and I started crying and I looked down and I watched as my tears fell. Big droplets. And all of a sudden, he'd catch them. Mm. I looked up at him and I can't even see. It's like, I was like, trying to look through my tears and I was you I was like you don't let my tears hit the floor he said no I've caught every single one of your tears I catch every tear that is everyone that has cried I have caught their tears and at that moment I was like you are everywhere omnipresent you've always watched over my life and he said the Jojo the desires in your heart are from me mm. and I go so the desire, the, the music that you have, he's, yes, it's from me. I've inspired you from day one to share my love on earth to the other children in this world. You know, Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. So that's deep right there. It, it, but How? dude, like the whole, my whole entire life, I literally thought God was this like stoic man ancient, very ugly looking, um, that would hit me with lightning strike every time I did something wrong. And it was, God totally was not that way when I saw him. He literally was like charismatically joyful. The angels had these huge rocket launchers that they were, they just like whipped him out of nowhere and were shooting huge fireworks, like giant fireworks into the sky. They were screaming and shouting for joy on top of their lungs, like welcoming me into the kingdom of God, like, yes! Praise be to the Lamb that was slain. Glory be to God. Like they were screaming on top of their lungs, like, yes, ah, and they were like yelling, and it was a ripping party. And I'm like, I'm hearing, I'm hearing music like Coldplay, Lauren Daigle, Lecrae, all that together. It sounded like one band. It wasn't them. It was like those types of sounds, those types of bands playing, like big band, small band, all together just booming over heaven. Like this surround sound music just started playing. And the first thought that went through my head, oh, the elders went and approved of this. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm with God. And nothing is, nothing's sin now. Right. And I literally just started jumping up and down. And by, God stopped shooting the laser beam at me a, a minute earlier. And I just felt free as a bird. I literally looked down, I had a new body. And I was the same size. <laughs> I didn't get any gross steroids, but the, uh, that was a joke. But uh, I remember feeling so free. And I remember thinking to myself, I am so grateful God took me away from the earth because of the pain, the disappointment, the curse. 
of sin that's on the earth. And your body looked typical to the body on earth. Your Absolutely, it's the same one, but I had no pain. Like, no skin flakes, uh, no scars. All my scars were gone. Like, he literally healed me. And I knew I was healed of, I knew I was healed of my bedwetting. I knew I was healed, I had celiac. My do the doctors previously had uh, told me that I was, it had an incurable disease called celiac. I could never eat anything with wheat in it ever again. And I knew I was healed of that. I could eat anything I wanted to. And I'm like in God's presence. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm in heaven. And I'm like, I mean, it's just in the throne room. This is just the beginning. And as I'm, as I'm stepping into this glory, he's like, you won't believe what's going on. And the angel and God start talking about memories in my life. And I'm going, wait, how does he know all this? And they were talking about a birthday I had. And my parents were like in the kitchen, like arguing on how to put the candles on this cake. And they talked about so many things. It's like a mental override. I'm currently writing a book to get all these details out. But I really just want people to know that God takes interest in the tiny details, like the fun things, like the fact you're holding a mic yeah. in a room with other men of God, he sees that. And I, this angel and God were just going back and forth and they were laughing about it. Like, why did I listen to this cake? So you're saying God was laughing. He was started laughing and like this glowing, like this, this face that shone like this. I could not see his nose. I couldn't see his eyes, but I felt so much love. I felt transformed. And I realized, wait, that's my guardian angel because he literally knew everything about me. And I realized that God has assigned every single one of us an uh, angel to watch over us. Describe a little bit about the personality of God that you experienced. It was uncomfortably, it was uncomfortably hippie slash know-it-all slash humble slash gracious. like. Okay, so the thing was like, it felt like God had a thousand personalities, but he controlled it all into a, uh, he related to me. Like I knew he had, he had found a level where he came down to my level, where he shattered every single um, box I'd put him in. Basically every single box I'd put God in, he just made sure he found a way to break that box. And he started showing me inventions. God started showing off. He's like... He showed me back when they made the first, like the first pump. There was a bunch of guys around this muddy pond and they had found a way to get this pump to go back and forth to get water from one level to a higher level. And God's like, check this out. I made the best pump and he points to my heart. And I'm like, you were so hilarious. He said, guess how they figured out that pump? And I'm like, I have no clue. Like, how did they figure out the pump? He's like, they took apart a heart just to figure out how that pump worked. Just how to make a pump. I'm like, are you serious? Like, yeah, all the valves. He started explaining like scientifically, started explaining how the valves in the heart work through that muscle in the squeezing process and the valves, one-way valves like the heart already has built in, how man has created the same thing by copying God's design already. I'm like, I just like, I basically just was like mind blown, mind blown, mind blown. And at that point we could see the earth again. So the earth was brought back into view and there was no demons on the earth. There was, he was like, had a, had a view. We had been able to zoom in on different things that were going on. We zoomed in on, you know, my siblings. One of them was helping my other sibling. It was like, a, it was like almost like a memory, watching a memory. And in my heart, I felt like, I was like, I am so glad. I'm so glad I'm not on earth. But yeah, I felt like the sorrow. I started feeling awful again. Like all of a sudden I started feeling shame. I started feeling like I was... I had, like, I felt so sad again all of a sudden because I felt bad for everyone that was on earth. And God goes, no, 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 you, no. There's no need for you to feel that ever again. He takes it from me. Like, this is like this, like, experience where you just said, here, just hand it to me. And I just like, okay, God, I give it to you. And I gave that, like, sadness up. He said, you will no longer feel sad. You will no longer feel, like, despair because I've called you to learn two things. And I'm like, what are those two things? Like, God's giving you my assignment for eternity. Remember, like, I feel like everything was happening at once, but yet everything was like drawn out. Like we had enough time to, uh, how do I explain it? Like we could read a book by just looking at the ends of the paper. That's how felt time was. It was like we could read the book when all the letters were side to side. Like instead of looking at it like a pa regular page reading left to right, we could read the book closed. That's how it felt. Tell us a little about heaven. Describe just like things you saw. You said at one point you saw a construction site or heard a construction yeah. site. Tell us a little bit about that. Just like, you know, even the grass. How did that look? Flowers. Were there more colors than here on earth? 
Yeah, okay, so this is really crazy. And it gets me super excited because a lot of people think that like heaven is like a bunch of uh, people with rings around their heads sucking lollipops on big fluffy clouds. That is the worst description you could ever think of. Think about doing what you love for all time with no pain, unlimited amount of resources, and unending wisdom. Like if you had all the knowledge in the world to do what you loved, you could become the ace of all time at what you wanted to do. So when I walked, when, when God said, okay, I want you to study my word and I want you to study music, my heart exploded with joy. Like for some reason, I felt like I was, if only I studied God's word for the rest of, his, of eternity, where there was no end to time, I knew I'd be happy. But the fact that he added on music showed me that he wanted me to have a really good time. And to, to wrap up that question of like, I started, when someone would speak and they would say something kind or they would say something like really fun, they would laugh. It would be like a sound wave that would go through the air and if I wanted to, I could taste it. But at the same time, I could turn my eyes off and just look at what was around me. But yet I could tune in to like, there was a bird flying through the air when, we, when God opened the gates up from the throne room into the kingdom of God. This tightly, it's like almost like this carpet, but it was tightly manicured grass that went up this huge hill. And on the other side of the hill, I could hear this magnificent, monumental, like some huge construction site going on. And I heard children, I heard adults, I heard people laughing, I heard them building. I heard people working with their hands, designing, creating, like I heard all that just with my hearing. Like my hearing was already still tuned in to these things that I normally could never, never hear. What do you think they were building? I think a city. Uh, lots of water slides, a so, lot of fun. That was <laughs> not just like this resort we go to. There's work to do, but it's work we're gonna love to do. Yeah, no, there's like, God gives us work that we will feel like 100% purpose filled. Like we'll be able to build insanely huge architects We'll be able to create our dream band. We'll be able to go on tours. Like it's, it's a, a place where, from what I understood at that brief moment, that there was no limit. Like every imposed limit, you don't have to pay for gas in heaven. If you want to go somewhere, you teleport. Right. You literally just command your body to go there and you're there instantly. And so the angels, I was assigned a woman angel and a, the, the, my guardian angel, the super ripped dude. And I either must have grown or they shrank because I had my arms around them both. And I remember walking in and I had my head thrown back and I was laughing so hard. I was like, yeah, this is so crazy. This is so awesome. I was just like blowing up with joy. Just literally like I was, they were telling me jokes. And I remember one of them was like, they're like, okay, let's, let's, let's get this lesson started. And God popped up. He loves holograms, like these, these moving screens that move in front of me. Now, you said there was women angels, too. Yeah, I knew it was a woman because had, she had long hair, but I didn't, like, feel attracted to her at all. I just knew it was, like, I was assigned an angel that looked like a woman. Right. And so when I, I had my arms around him, that's when God's like, okay, it's time for you to start your, your lessons. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's go. And to back up a little bit, when he said it's time for me to... Um, learn two things his word and music he first showed me a flash like he could tell I didn't understand what that meant by studying his word so he took the word righteous he just grabbed it real quick brought it right in front of me he flipped it on it so I could see it from the top I couldn't read the word he pulled out like 40 something definitions of what righteous meant behind he said Jojo you think you know what righteous means but I have something way more for you every word that I've placed in the Bible has been inspired by me and every word has a deeper meaning. The naked eye can only see the letters, but the spiritual eye, the spiritual eye can the spiritual eye can literally see what is beyond that word. And so when we got into the kingdom of heaven, like that we started walking up that hill, I could hear the city that was being built on the other side or some huge event happening. The the music lesson started and the first one was a five part harmony where you have your regular four part harmony and then you had subharmonic levels above and below them. And I remember thinking to myself like, how can there be soprano, alto, tenor, bass? And then there's a level that the hu regular human ears cannot hear. That God was wo moving into it that would incite emotional feelings. And I remember looking up and seeing a bird flying through the air 
and it started singing a tune. And all of heaven gathered behind that tune that that bird was singing and played a beat. And like the symphony started, it's like dun 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 dun. dun. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this is crazy. <laughs> Excuse me. I get so excited, my voice gets dry. Now, was there a food or things to drink in heaven? So I didn't get to eat anything or drink anything yet, but I felt complete. I felt so full, and I knew we were gonna eat, but I just hadn't got to that part of the day yet. And um, the funny thing was, like, when I looked up, there was no sun. It was like this constant glow above us. Like there was a there was this light that was coming from the grass. There was a light that was coming from within us. There was a light that shone from my chest. There was a light that shone from my arms. My angel next to me, the big, strong, ripped dude, he was, he was glowing. This lady angel, she was glowing. And heaven was glowing. And I remember thinking, there's no more darkness. I, well, I'll never have to worry about nighttime again. Because I, nighttime. That's described in Revelations. That there's no need for the sun. <laughs> and this is what blows my mind, because I would hear scripture verses lining up with what I was seeing in heaven. Like, Oh, this just gets me so excited. Um, and so this is where it's coming to a close here. So I'm walking into heaven. I'm on the edge of this field. And the second music lesson hits. He's like, all right, it's time for the second music. And God would prompt me. He's like, okay, it's time for the second lesson. And he's like commentating, like commenting on our lesson as we're going. Like, all right, let's cue this next one in. And it's a 10-part harmony with a four-part harmony with like, three above it and like four below is crazy now you just hear god's voice was he there or just hearing no. his voice i heard it started it was within me i heard his voice inside of me i'm like okay that's sort of cool he he like knows everything he's inside of me but he's like i heard it from like over the hill from behind me and like i knew he was still in the throne room but i knew like god knows every single thought that was going on in my mind like we became one like there was nothing that i was thinking that he wasn't feeling Mm. And I, it's the trippiest feeling yeah. to know like someone knows everything at any moment, what I'm going to say. And then also like he, he plays on inspiration too. Like he wants to give you inspiration. So he'll like allude to something you should think about. And then once you get a good idea, he's like, that's a great idea. But he's the one that inspired it. Like he would do that all the time. Like when we were talking about the inventions, I'd like be asking parent. questions. Like I'm like, wait, like, you just gave me this idea, but yet you're, comp you're like complimenting me for having a great idea. He just did that all the time. Like he took so much joy in seeing my eyes light up uh, on a subject. And so the music lesson folds away. I just remember just laughing again. And I'm just like in bliss. And if you just close your eyes and just, just think about your happiest moment in life, whether that means you made all the money in the world at that one moment or like you realize you weren't going to die or whatever. the If you could find the happiest moment in your life, times it by 10 and have zero pain and know that you're going to live in that happiest moment forever, that's how I felt. I and, and at that moment, all of a sudden, like I was on my pillow again, actually this side. I was like, Poof. and I'm, I wake up and I, my eyes open and I could move my head. I started moving my head back and forth. I felt my neck. And I just screamed, I yelled, and I flipped off my bed, I just grabbed the carpet, and I just like yelled, no, into my carpet. Because I'm on earth, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the vision just like that. Like, this, the split second I was in, now I can't get back. Like, I, I was like, no, 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 what, like, what if this is part of the vision? I'm like, I'm back on earth. And I could, my hearing, I couldn't hear anything. I looked down, I wasn't glowing. Like, angels were gone. Like. The, my hearing was like was closed gold, again. So everything was, your senses just gold down. I started feeling pain again. I started feeling weary, like my back hurt, but something felt different in here. I started going, wait, like, hold on. Like, I don't have dark thoughts. I don't have this demonic oppression. Please this dark mind Kampf, this dark night of the soul was over. Mm. And God literally delivered me of depression in, through that vision. And then the out of body experience. I truly believe I died, left my body, and then came back. Because the encounter with him brought forth deliverance. Yeah, and and that's the thing where I, I woke up. I started weeping after I got off the carpet. I started weeping. My brother ran in the room. He's like, "Why are you crying? You never cry. Like, what's wrong with you?" I shared with him. He started crying. That night, I was leading youth group. I told, I said, "Listen, I, I just saw God," and a few people were like, "No way." You didn't just see God. That's not, that's not true. And then 
there was two or three other people that confirmed that the Holy Spirit had been moving on the young people that week. Someone heard music in their sleep. Majestic music. They couldn't put words to it. Another one felt like God was talking to them. And I received a vision, an out-of-body experience that healed me of my depression. And so... I shared the whole story with them. People started crying. People started repenting of their sin. Like some people were doing some pretty ratchet stuff. And they repented of it. Revival broke out. A bunch of these young ladies that had been impressioned their whole life were like, they went and they wanted to go to college for the first time to become the first educated woman of their family. They wanted to become the first educated woman of their family. And the elders literally told them no. And at this time when I woke up, I thought I could fix the church. I thought I could stay in the Hutterite group. I thought I could stay in the colony. I thought, you know, I thought I could, I could revive this sick horse. God later showed me on, I had a completely separate vision, but he showed me in another vision that the horse was dead and he wanted me to leave and go, go, go away from this dead religion, this skeleton that had no more life in it and go find his body, his church right here meet people like you, you know, meet brothers in Christ that were not just, I'm going to be straight, these people were pretty racist. They didn't have people of color in their midst. They were not open to even, even ministering in the Asian communities. They were not willing to go into any of these other communities and share the good news of the gospel. And I said, if I'm going to die for what I believe, I will go to anyone. Praise God. And I will not stop with people that look like me. Because I feel like that's a demonic spirit in itself. That's, oh, you gotta only stick with your type. I'm like, that's the most messed up thing. My, my, some of my ancestors were killed because of their color. Right. The Indians. And it's like, I have like a 124th percent of Indian in me, but I can track it back. And one of my grandmothers is Indian, but like, for me, I'm realizing that we all come from Adam. We all are one blood. And it's time, like, we, Share this gospel of hope with people. And that racism goes both sides. It's like a spirit. It's a, it's a, de it's a demonic it's spirit. or white. I mean, it's both sides. It doesn't discriminate. Yeah. You know? And, and we see that in different cultures. You know, we, even within the black church, the Hispanic church, and things like that sometimes. And in the white church, it's just some of them have that spirit where they have ought against another race. Well, even men against women. Like, I saw men oppressing women, telling them to shut up publicly. They would be like, no, you be quiet in Jesus' name. I'm like, are you joking right now? This woman's trying to share her testimony. Wow. And um, the whole purpose of me sharing this story and anybody that hears this, I just literally want you to know, if you're listening to this audio or watching this video right now, you need to understand that God has placed good desires in your heart that he's, he's asking you to awaken to. If you do not know what those desires are, fall on your knees cry out to Abba Father and ask Him to open your eyes to what these desires are that He wants you to follow. Because God has designed every single one of us, just like we all have a unique fingerprint. Better not show my fingerprint or someone else can steal it, but just kidding. But like, just like each one of us has a unique fingerprint, He's given us all unique purpose. And He's calling you wherever you're at. If you're driving a truck right now or you're taking care of 10 children at a daycare center, He's called you even if you're the President of the United States, listen to this right now. He's called you to follow the desires that He has placed in your heart to do good in this world. All praise, praise to God. Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, here you are today. You're married. Yes. You have your own business. Yes, sir. How'd that all come about? Yeah. So, it's my own business is still in the process. I have a dream of owning my own successful business. Right now, what I do is I, I currently write music. haven't published any of it yet. But I really, really feel God's called me to publish it soon. I'm in the middle of writing a book. And really what I want to do is just give people hope one person at a time. You know, I used to be overwhelmed with like reaching 20,000 people at a time, 50,000 people at a time. But God called me to just minister to one-on-one. -on -one. And I believe that if you're faithful and little, God will bless you with a lot. Now going a little bit backwards, you, uh, you were excommunicated from the church, right? And even your family, that brought a rip between you and your family. But yeah. since then, there's been some healing. You want to yeah. talk about that? Absolutely. So I'm really grateful that there has been healing with me. Um, unfortunately, some of my other siblings still get mistreated. Uh, my sisters get mistreated to this day by, unfortunately, my parents between my parents and my siblings, their relationship is not good. And I'm calling out 
the Mennonites. I'm calling out these super conservative groups to say, God has been calling these groups for so many years. They need to break away from this dead, dead religion. And if anybody is involved in like a dead religion, there's hope. You do not have to stay stuck in it. There's a way out. Because like I say, 95, 98% of people that try to leave the Mennonites go right back because they don't know how to live life without the structure, without the control. And so with my parents, they're still in the Mennonite circles. But I truly believe God has, he's calling them to be filled with his love, his grace, and his purpose. Now you talk about you feel like, you feel, still feel like you're called to be a pastor. Yes, I feel like that's a, a cumulative of calling. This it's it's becoming revealed, you know. It's something I should walk in more, I guess. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, now a little bit about you said that that when you left, just take us a little bit of how that was, just psychologically, spiritually. You know, how did you deal with that? I mean, here you are. This is all you knew was this culture. Then all of a sudden, cold turkey, you just broke off from that. Yeah. How was that? I mean, what, I mean, how'd you sustain through all that? Yeah, um, I'm gonna give an analogy first, so sort of help you understand the crazy shift. Is imagine if you are in a greenhouse in Antarctica, and you're a little tomato plant with a beautiful little like tomato, and you all you know is a protected greenhouse structure underneath the earth. You've been warm your whole life. You know nothing else. And all of a sudden, one day, someone takes you and plants you right outside in the cold, harsh environment where there's polar bears and penguins walking past you. That's literally how I felt. And I know that analogy has so many contradictions in it. Let's not dive into that. Sorry. But that's how I felt. Um, to give you a little perspective, I'd never been to a movie theater before. So I went to my first movie theater in 2017 with my sisters. My sisters, thank you, Jesus. They actually left before I did. They, they paved the way. These women of God paved the way for me. Two of them are getting their nursing degrees. One of them is a successful um, business owner. She makes the best wedding cakes out there in the universe. But anyways, these people, these beautiful humans, these beautiful sisters that I'm grateful to call my siblings have really taken a step of faith first, which allowed me to escape. I had to escape. I didn't have any money to my name. Probably like a hundred bucks when I left. I borrowed a car because I didn't have my own car. I just started working in construction right when I left. And, um, to give you a little perspective, when I left, I didn't even know what a, uh, like a woman's private was. I had no idea of anything in this world. So when I started hearing all these words going on job sites, people like, you know, doing uh, like meth in the, the, the porta potties, they're smoking up joints in different rooms. Like we're trying to build these apartment structures. Like I'm like, I'm like smiling, like Jesus is awesome. Like I love you. Want a hug? You want a hug? They're like, dude, are you hiring crack or something? And I remember thinking, like, no, I'm not hiring crack. But like, why do you? Why are you? Like, why don't you just have this joy? Like, what's wrong? Like, why do you just accept Jesus in your life? And that's where I started encountering like darkness, like darkness and light. Just and I got plugged into a, a church and. Oklahoma and my pastor I love him so much I'm gonna call him out his name is CJ Ellis he's up in Reading right now but he walked through the deepest crap of the religion I had to deal with to un unprogram my mind because when you leave this you have to reprogram your mind you have to be have put the mind of Christ on you must put the mind of Christ on you cannot think you can leave an abusive situation and be good you need to renew your mind. Because if you don't fill your mind with something that's good, seven more demons are going to come fill it, and it's going to be worse than before. That's right. Praise God. Wow, that's, that's powerful. So, and you said you yeah. had one friend, I guess, when you had left, that you was able to make contact with that had left yeah. previously. Yeah, well, my older sister. And it's okay. Yeah, and so then I got connected to their friend group. And then their friend group connected to me, the greater body of Christ. And I realized there was only 100 people going to heaven. I started realizing, oh, this is, there's a few more people going to heaven than I thought. You're like, this is awesome. Like, I'm not alone, you know? <laughs> so that's sort of where I was, you know? And I just, God, yeah, it's a day-by-day -day experience. And my dream is to, um, I, I really would love to do music full-time. That's my dream. And you met your wife through that church group? Yes, through, actually through Instagram. I met a preacher on Instagram who invited me to, his friend invited me to come out to California. His family provided me a place to stay. A miracle situation. I had no money. Zero. I lived on beans and avocados every day for like six months. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. And I, uh, I did freelance videography until I finally was able to like pay more than just the rent. And then I ended up marrying a beautiful young woman who's got the spirit of God resting upon her. And um, we are growing in love. Praise growing God. in love to this very day. Now, I just want you to... Leave some words from our audience. I mean, this has been a powerful testimony. You Thank you. Tough words, but but I mean, oh, you know, some closing words because that, I mean, that was just so powerful. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think hmm. you know the message of just finding purpose that God has a purpose for all of us. The desires that you you touched on how God told you He put that desire in your heart, right, for music, and you know, like we talked about Psalms thirty-seven four, God tells us His Word tells us to light yourself in the Lord and he'll give us the desires of your heart so um, if, if you could just follow up on that and just uh, leave whatever God has put in your heart for our audience Ooh, God is inspirational um, if you ever have any like talking about God it's like talking about gravity you've never seen it but you've, you you see the effect of it every single day um, I feel like Thank you, Heavenly Father, for just anointing my lips right now for this, this, this moment. I truly, truly believe that every single person, like I said earlier, like has a unique fingerprint of purpose over their life. And I, I literally feel like my number one calling, not only is to do music, but is to call out that dream in them. And I want, like, if you're hearing this right now, it's one in 700 trillion chances that you were born. Atheist scientists put these facts together. They said it was a miracle. If you take the whole surface of the ocean and put a life ring in the middle and have one turtle swimming around randomly, it's the same odds of that turtle coming up for one breath that you were born on this earth. So if you are listening to this, you are not alone. You are loved. You are beloved. You have, God has a unique purpose for your life and He, he has that freely waiting for you to tap into. He's not running around in the dark like, like I, I have a saying. He's not, he's not a butterfly asking you to chase it in the dark. He has it in front of you and all you got to do is ask. The Bible says ask and you shall receive. He's not a God that wants to run away from you. He's a God that's always he's your very breath. And I just think that demolish anything you thought about God and be willing to start with a fresh slate with His Word. Get connected to the body don't go into this alone. Um, plug into Raymond, your group here, Thug Life Exposed. Like it's it's really really just powerful. You know, like don't go life alone. Don't do life alone. You know. Bless your name. Yeshua. Yeshua. We bless your name. We bless your name.